Church, one of those verses, angels descending, whispers of love. The message this morning is about this. But it's a challenging message, as we will see. I want you to be in Ephesians chapter 6. We've already covered much of the letter of Ephesians. We're in the final verses. Remember, finally means we just have more to say. Um, So we have more to say in the letter of Ephesians. Paul tells the church that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. As unpopular to the culture as this sounds, we do not struggle with ourselves. We do not struggle with our neighbors. By struggle, we mean from the Greek language, wrestle. It's like a wrestling match. And in this wrestling match, we try to fight to find out who is going to win. And the Bible says that our struggle, our wrestling match, is not with each other. But yet, if you ask most people in the world, they would tell you that no, it's against so-and-so who has hurt me. In fact, we spend countless hours stewing over people who have hurt us, who have harmed us, and who have injured us. And our wounds are deep. In our culture today, we are wrestling against forms of government and economics, and we are struggling against various relationships we have, whether the relationships are found in our home or found in our church, or found in our workplace, or even our community. At least this is what we think. We think our struggle is against these flesh and blood things. But Paul says in the Holy Spirit, we struggle not against flesh and blood. He then says, but. He's using the employment of, of this word that there is a struggle, and it is real. He's not dismissing the struggle. He's trying to give us proper spiritual eyes so that we can look to see who the real enemy is. Would you look at one another right now and just say, you're not my enemy? Now, some of you are still thinking about it. But I assure you that loved one next to you is not your enemy. Whether that loved one comes in a spouse, a friend, a brother, or sister, they are not your enemy. In the last few years, the the saying has been rejuvenated and used often on the news that that we can't win a war when we don't know who the enemy is. Anybody heard that? Well, church, we may not be winning right now because we've not recognized the true enemy. We've been deceived into thinking it's flesh and blood. He says, but there is a struggle, and and it's, it's not this something of flesh and blood. It's something else. Now, next to the subject of hell, there is a most unpopular subject a preacher must preach. And I'm thankful I'm going through the letter of Ephesians because it's not like I planned this sermon. It was there, and if I didn't cover it, then I would be dishonest to you because it's in black and white in the Scripture. It must be spoken in the church. We must read these verses, and we must come to an understanding It's an unpopular subject. It's misunderstood. It's treated with ridicules by some. It's scorned by the many, and it's rejected by the educated. Because of the lack of awareness to this subject, there are many in our local churches today living unhealthy lives and without victory. Because the world scorns and rejects this subject, many are perishing even as we gather here this morning. The subject is the struggle defined in our lives. The Holy Spirit says our struggle in verse 12 is against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. Now, no human being was mentioned there. It's all cosmic powers. And he says... That is where our struggle is. It's not with humans. It's against spiritual forces, says the Lord through 
the Apostle Paul. Now, spiritual forces that are evil are defined as rulers, authorities, cosmic powers. And note, the struggle is in the heavens. I thought about this driving over to church this morning, and there are some things about these verses that I must say. There's, there's an illustration I'm getting ready to, to share that many will kind of fall back from and say, really, is that true? It's a hard subject. And all of a sudden I realized around me, but not with me, was this spiritual struggle. Because if I don't say it, you may never know it. If I don't say it, you may never own up to it and come closer and draw closer to the God who is drawn near to you. The struggle is for the defeat of God's children, the church. And the struggle is for the souls of men and women in the world. Our struggle is with Satan and his demons. Not our brothers and sisters, not our neighbors, and not even our enemies. We are put at odds with flesh and blood by the spiritual forces of darkness. And that is the subject that is most often scorned and rejected. Yet, we read in the Bible that Eve wrestled with an evil spiritual force over the choosing of knowledge over life. We see that Adam wrestled with evil spiritual forces to care for and to provide for his helpmate at her most critical moment of need. We see that Cain wrestled with evil spiritual forces over jealousy and the murder of his brother. We see that Jacob wrestled with God. Throughout the Old and New Testament, each and every battle of right or wrong, choosing God or choosing the world's way, came down to the spiritual battle located in the heavens. Every choice of a battle that you've suffered in this life has been caused by a spiritual force. Not a popular subject in the world. We want to blame others and other things that we've experienced. This is powerfully shown in Daniel chapter 10, and I want you to turn there with me. It's Old Testament, a little bit past halfway of the Old Testament. You'll find Daniel chapter 10. And you're going to see in the opening verse of Daniel chapter 10 that we read that a message was revealed to Daniel. The message was true. And notice that this message was about a great conflict, the same type of wording in the Hebrew language that we find in the Greek language, a struggle. It was a great conflict. The Bible tells us in this opening verse that Daniel understood the message and he had understanding of the vision. And what we soon discover is that Daniel knew the conflict is between God and Satan and the nation's of the world were the objects of the conflict. Daniel was revealed all the history throughout mankind to the end where Christ's kingdom is established forever. Daniel saw what was ahead, what was in a far distance, and at the very end. Daniel saw an incredible vision. And he saw the conflict, the struggle, And it's boiled down that God desires his created to love him, to follow him, and trust him. But understand that Satan desires the world to hate God, to follow the desires of their heart, and to trust in anything other than God. And that's the battle. Satan desires to wound the heart of God by stealing his created. The conflict is tremendous. For in the end, man's ways, the world's ways, will be destroyed, and God's kingdom will be eternal. If man or woman chooses God, they will be secured in his love for all of eternity. But if a man or a woman chooses the deception given in the spiritual battle, they will perish for all of eternity. No higher stakes are known than the spiritual battle. But church... Take heart. Jesus has overcome, and in Christ we are overcomers. Now, even with that said, today, 
there remains a tremendous struggle that is played over and over. It is this spiritual battle called our struggle in Ephesians verse 12. I want you to stay in Daniel chapter 10 for a moment. But in the context of our text, it's the great struggle. Daniel, in our illustration, was in the center of this great struggle. So I just want to show you a couple of verses here that when when Daniel received this vision, in verse 2, we find that he mourned for three full weeks. This was a devastating to his heart message that he had received. And so he mourned for three weeks. 21 days is three weeks. He confesses that he didn't eat any rich food or meat or wine touched his mouth. He says he didn't even put oil on his body. Here, here's what it was. At the end of 21 days, he looked awful. His hair was unkempt. He probably didn't smell too good. And, and he had been stressed out over this vision. And so we find that in verse 5, that, that, that he was standing on the bank of this great river Tigris, and as he looks up, there was this man that was dressed in dazzling attire. And in verse 8, when he saw this vision, we see that, that Daniel was, was looking at this great vision. He was all by himself in, in this, this vision, and that he had no strength left in him, and his, his face grew deathly pale, and he was powerless. And so he heard these words from the one who had appeared He fell into a deep sleep, and his face was in the ground. If we want to hear from God, church, we must get our face in the ground. We must lower ourselves to hear from the high and holy God. So Daniel, with face in the ground, suddenly a hand touches him and raised him to his hands and his knees. And this This angel said, Daniel, you are a man treasured by God. Church, are we treasured by God? Say yes or no. So everything that's happening to Daniel, God shows no favoritism. Guess what? God will do for us. So take heart. He says, Daniel, you're treasured. You know, the, the, the Hebrew means, Daniel, you're greatly loved. You are beautiful and precious to God. Church, that's you. You're beautiful and precious. If you grew up around people who who said otherwise or you were taught otherwise that you're some kind of an accident from nature, you can dismiss it. God so loved the world. He loves us. And so to Daniel, who believed in the Lord and was obedient to the Lord, he was treasured by God, just as the church is treasured by God today. He says, stand on your feet. Notice we always got to get down to the rowdy. You got to stand, church. Stand on your feet. And he says, I've been sent to you. And and after he says this, Daniel confesses, I stood trembling. But he was standing, amen? He stood trembling. So he goes on to say, don't be afraid. And here's what I wanted you to hear in verse 12. From the first day, he's talking to Daniel, from the first day that you purposed to understand. He's going back. 21 days before. He says, Daniel, that day that you purposed in your heart to understand and you humbled yourself before your God, your prayers were what? Heard. But church, it's been 21 days. Can I speak to you humanly for a moment? Daniel had the right to say, wait a minute, God, that was 21 days ago, and I've not been living too well waiting for the answer. What have you been praying for, church, that you've not heard the answer to? Instead of accusing God of wrong, see what was going on in this spiritual battle that is upon this world in the heavenlies. Daniel had prayed. He had given it to the Lord, and now he's told your prayers were heard. In case you're new to the Bible, the Bible tells us that when God hears your prayers, he answers your prayers. So 21 days ago, it was answered, but Daniel had not yet received. What prayers have you lifted that have already been answered? You just haven't received them yet. And why? Maybe you haven't received those answers yet. This angel says, I have come because of your prayers. Then he says in verse 13, notice this church, 
the prince of the kingdom of Persia. I don't have time this morning to go and show you that Satan. You can get a good concordance out. But basically Satan and his angels were opposing God's angel for how many days? 21. How many days did Daniel mourn? No accidents with God. While Daniel was hanging on, there was a fight, a spiritual battle going on. And and the angel was coming to answer Daniel's prayer, to answer the question of what will happen to his people in the last days. Satan was trying to block that. You know why we pray in the name of Jesus? Because Satan wants to block your prayers from ever being heard. If you are just praying, hey, holy, greater something out there that I'm not really sure who you are, will you answer this prayer for me? It'll never get above the ceiling. But on our knees, if we pray, Lord Jesus, in your powerful name, I pray. Angels cannot prevent that nor stop that. Why do we pray in the name of Jesus? Because Jesus has already defeated Satan. You say, well, do we have to pray in the name of Jesus? No. You just don't have to have your prayers answered either. It's up to you. Jesus said, pray in my name. Why? Because Satan, his demonic angels, will try to block the prayers. We'll try. Okay? So we see that I've come here to help you to understand. While he was saying these words, verse 15, I turned my face toward the ground and was speechless. Now verse 16, someone else enters. Suddenly, one with human likeness touched my lips. And notice Daniel sees him standing in front of him and he calls him my Lord. He's seeing the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. And he's seeing Jesus touch his lips. Daniel confesses he's not worthy. And then the one with human likeness who had touched him, touched him again and what? Strengthened him and said, don't be afraid. You are treasured by God. He said, peace be upon you. And as he spoke, Daniel was strengthened. Now remember, as Jesus spoke, pre-incarnate Jesus spoke to Daniel, he was strengthened. Now, would you turn back to Ephesians chapter 10? If you don't believe there is a spiritual war going all around you, then you probably won't have much to do with this passage. The world has duped many, but the truth is there is an evil day in which we live. There is a struggle called the spiritual battle. So Paul says, back to Ephesians chapter 6, he says, put on the full armor of God. Not so that you look good, not that you look like a Christian, but so that you can stand against the tactics of the devil. There's the key. We've been saved. Praise God. We've been sealed for the day of redemption. Praise God. But the apostles even told us we will suffer to enter the kingdom of heaven. What is the suffering? It's the spiritual battle. Well, why would God do that to us? God's not doing it to us. God has given us the armor to come through it. The evil forces are doing the battle. We have to stop blaming God for the ills of Satan. We have to. Because that's how the church has been derailed in many circumstances in our culture. We can see in the Bible that there are demons who work the tactics of the devil. Let me just give you an idea of what the Bible tells us. There are demonic forces who have oversight of the nations. That's correct. Demonic forces over the nations. That's the United States, that's Russia, that's the Middle East. Any nation you can name, there are demonic forces over the nation. You say, no, 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 Jesus defeated. Jesus did defeat Satan. But Jesus said, I am coming soon. Their time is short. So the struggle goes on. But Jesus has already made way for the victory. But there are demonic forces who have oversight of the nations. Have you wondered why our nation is slipping into total chaos and dysfunction politically, economically, and every other kind of ism or ickily? It's because there are demons over the nations. Demonic forces wanting possession over people. There are demonic forces who have charge of Satan's worldly business. There are demonic forces in the heavenlies who have charge of religions who deny that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. Satan's force is manipulating the world. The heartbreak that we see, the heartache that we feel, 
the tremendous suffering, the tragedies of life are the work of Satan in the background in the heavenlies. He is the cause of the great problems in the world. As Jesus himself said, he is the murderer from the beginning. In church, our struggle is spiritual, not flesh and blood around us. The church in 2022, in our nation and the world, has lost sight of Or worse, the church has rejected biblical truth concerning this spiritual battle, which is our struggle. Many within our local churches have been silenced, duped, and weakened because they have been told that hell, Satan, and demons don't exist. Jesus, who walked the earth for for 33 years and in his ministry ministered for three years, one of the most spoken topics of Jesus' ministry was of hell and the demonic forces. He spoke of it more than of salvation. Are we actually going to say that Jesus didn't know what he was talking about? Are we actually going to say that somehow humanity has evolved so well that there is no such thing as demons? And there are many people buying in to that. Culture is saying race, parents, politics, governments, And even our upbringing is the struggle that we have. We blame parents and patriarchs. We blame this and that. And we we forget as children of Jesus Christ that the struggle is not against flesh and blood. You say, well, pastor, I truly remember my daddy beating me. How can you say it's not flesh and blood? Because daddy, unfortunately, is used by Satan many times just as mommy, just as pastors, just as deacons, just as Sunday school teachers, just as presidents, just as government leaders. All can be under the influence unless we put on the armor of God. This struggle is overwhelming the many because we, the church, have forgot, or worse, many have rejected that the, uh, within the church that we are to have a special kind of dress code. We are to dress appropriately for the battle. And so that's what we want to look at quickly this morning because Paul says, take up the full armor of God. That's the dress code. That's the battle dress uniform that we are to wear. The question is, why this armor? He says, so that you may be able to resist. That word resist from the Greek means stand up against. It means to oppose. It means to withstand. We are to wear this full armor of God so that we will stand up against the evil day in which we live. And so we read these words, take your stand. Even as it says elsewhere in the Bible, when we have done all that we can do to stand, stand therefore. But you're not going to stand, church, without the armor. Pastors are not going to stand without the armor of God. Church leaders, church ministry workers, we're not going to stand without the armor of God. The question, as I asked last week, is how? But how do we stand? Even with this armor, how do we stand? The answer of how is obviously only in the armor of God, But we need to know what that is. Remember, Paul has already taught the church at Ephesus, and by extension us, to put on Christ. So if you take notes, the first thing you want to see is put on the armor of God equals put on Christ. That's the first thing we're going to see this morning. Paul has not changed his theology. Paul has not changed his teaching. What he started way back in chapters 4 and 5, he's still continuing on in chapter 6. But now is the application. What does it look like? What does it mean to put on Christ? Now, I want you to look at chapter 6. I'm going to be in verses 14 to 17 here. And I want you to understand that Paul knew well the Roman soldier's uniform. He had been chained to them. He had been arrested by them several times. He had been beaten by them. He knew everything about the Roman soldier's uniform because he was constantly looking at it. Even as he wrote this letter, he was probably looking across the table 
or, or across the floor and seeing the Roman soldier that was guarding him while he was in prison writing this letter. I think sometimes we get too focused on the pieces of equipment instead of what the piece of equipment is. So I'm not going to tell you what gospel shoes are. I hope you know what a shoe is. I hope you know what a breastplate is and what it protects. I hope you know that a shield defends you. I hope you know these things. But what is the shield? What are the shoes? What is the helmet? We know what it looks like. Now, what does it all mean? Paul again says first, stand there. Stand therefore because of our struggle. And then he says in verse 14, with. Stand with. Those two words are extremely important. First, you got to stand up, but you can't stand up on your own. You have to stand with something. And then he begins the armor. Now, he says stand with, and the word with is from the Greek preposition of in. It's spelled in our language from the Greek en, but it means a fixed position. So you're standing fixed, and in that fixed is a relationship. It's a relational word. So when I stand with my wife, you can infer when I say with my wife, that wife is the relationship to me. We're one unit before God. We're one person before God. So it's a relationship. Now, if you know that I'm married and I stand with someone else, well, now you know I've got a problem because I'm not one with that person. So there's a relationship involved here. And he says to, to stand with. Um, when, when you look at the word in Greek, this en, it, it's relationship resting in peace. Resting. Uh, at rest in peace. Does that define our lives as Christians today? Resting? At peace? Or are, is our lives just everywhere, going everywhere at one time? Uh, the thing I've learned in, in, in just my short time here on earth is that greatest weapon of Satan is distractions and busyness. Satan defeats me, knocks me down every single time with distractions and busyness. I feel like I'm really getting things done. I feel like things are really going well. And all of a sudden I look at the end of the week and I've accomplished nothing in the Lord, but I got a lot of busyness done. I handle a lot of distractions. But how many souls heard the gospel of Jesus Christ? How, how many saints were edified, built up in the Lord? And so we see here this with is a relation of rest. And in that rest, you could also translate it peace. You could translate it confidence. So we're to stand up with, and the first thing he says is truth. We're to stand with truth. The psalmist said to the Lord Jesus, guide me in your truth and teach me. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. Who do we claim saves us? That person is the one we to stand up in, resting in, relational to Jesus Christ. The truth. He says, and I live by your truth. The psalmist also says, teach me your way, Lord, and I will live by your truth. So you have, guide me, Lord, teach me, Lord, and give me an undivided mind to fear your name. And so he declares, this is key, church, I have chosen the way of truth. That's not true with the world today. So all we can ask is of ourselves: have we chosen the way of truth? I just had a discussion this week with somebody I really don't know. Actually, I don't know him. But kind of it was a pilot discussion, pilot and Jesus, on the night that Jesus uh, was arrested, betrayed. And, and Pilate, he finally meets Pilate in this mock trial, and Pilate says, kind of scoffingly, what is truth? I had one of those discussions with someone. And it was weird because truth, from the Greek word that we have here, means obvious to the eye. I mean, it's just like the nose on your face. It's just plain. That's what the Greek word tells us truth is. And this person was talking all kinds of crazy stuff that had nothing to do with the truth. And that's not my problem with him, but I could see the spiritual battle all around us. 
Because the Bible tells us that Satan, one of his tools is to deceive the minds so that they remain unbelievers. So he says in this, I have chosen the way of truth. Well, Jesus said, I am the truth. Let me cut to the chase in the, in the sake of time. If you're going to stand with truth, you can only stand with Jesus because there is no other truth. All other gods, all other religions, all other philosophies, although they might sound good and have some nice things at nice moments, they are not the truth. The Bible says God is the truth, man is the liar. Anything that we choose outside of Jesus Christ is faulty, shaky ground that will cause us to perish. Jesus is the only way, he's the only truth, and he's the only life. So what is Paul saying? He said, put on Christ in the earlier chapter of Ephesians. Now he's saying, stand up with truth. What is he saying? With Jesus. Put Jesus not only in your heart, but put Jesus all around you and walk in Jesus. We're not done there, but keep looking. He, he says, we are to stand in this relational position with Jesus so that we can stand against the tactics of the devil in this evil day. Remember Jesus, he overcame the temptation. How are we overcoming our temptations, church? Answer, the only way we can is put on Jesus. Every time Satan shot one of his darts of lies, though he based it on the Bible, Jesus refuted him with what? Philosophy? His education? His position? The Word of God. Jesus said, man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Jesus is the Word of God. So, we want to put on Jesus. Now look what he says next in verse 14. We stand with truth and now we stand also with righteousness. We have a relationship with righteousness. We already know through the word of God that righteousness, that Jesus is the righteousness of God. Righteousness is a legal term. It's what we can equally say justify, justification. If someone commits a crime in the verdict comes out guilty, the only way they can walk in society is to be justified through a penalty. The person does some kind of penalty, and now they're justified. They're able to continue on. When it comes to God, there is only one justification. His name is Jesus Christ. And so when we come to Jesus, he has paid in full our sin debt. He has, he has made us one with God. And so when we stand with righteousness, who are we standing with? Jesus. Who is truth? Jesus. Who is righteousness? Jesus. What so far is the armor of God? Jesus. Why is it that we try to find so many other things to put on or to protect ourselves with when Jesus is the answer? He goes on, verse 15 speaks of the readiness of the gospel of peace. So the next armor is the gospel of peace. The way that you say gospel of peace in the translation is the good news of being set at one again. Everyone has sinned. All people have sinned, the Bible tells us. Not one is exempt. We've all committed sin. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible even says not one is righteous, not even one. What that means is God sent his son to become our righteousness to take care of, redeem our sin. And the only thing that could redeem our sin, think about this, the only thing that could set me at one with God again was the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. None of my works would work. None of my good sayings, none of my good looks, none of that would work. Whether I wear a suit or wear jeans to church, whether, whether I'm an American citizen or a Russian citizen, whether I'm this or that, not by works that we are saved, but what? By faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. That's our salvation. So we stand with truth. 
We stand with righteousness and we stand with the good news of peace that Jesus Christ died for our sins and has set us at one again with God when we confess that He is Lord. So our armor so far is Jesus, Jesus, and Jesus. Are you catching a theme here? Look at verse 17, or excuse me, uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 17. It says, He, speaking of Jesus, came and proclaimed the good news of peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. Uh, literally to the Scripture, he, he, he proclaimed peace to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. So we Gentiles were far away, the Jews were near. The Jews as a nation rejected Jesus. They said, crucify him. There are many Gentiles who are to this day rejecting the message of Jesus. But he also has come to those who are near, those who see the righteousness of God, who see Jesus. So Ephesians chapter 2 verse 14 says, he, Jesus, is our peace who made both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility. Uh, a person still living hostile to their neighbor, to their friend, to their brother, to their sister. If a person still living in hostility to flesh and blood, they have not yet met Jesus's, Jesus Christ's salvation. They're still living outside of salvation. Because Jesus has reconciled, tore down the dividing wall between Jew and Gentile. Gentile is nationalities, tribes, languages of people. So all peoples have been made into one new person. He stresses this in verse 15 of chapter 2, that Jesus made no effect of the law. He made no effect of the law. But pastor, I've never broken the law. I don't believe that, but if you want to confess that, that's up to you. But the law, Jesus made no effect of. You, if you take Jesus' body and blood, he has nailed the law to the cross for you. He's paid in full its sin consequence, which is death, and you've been made free from the law. We now live in the law of the Spirit. We now live in the freedom of the Holy Spirit to live what Christ has called us to do. So he's made no effect of the law. He did this so that he might create in himself one new man from the two, resulting in peace. So we stand with truth, righteousness, ready of the gospel of peace. In verse 16, in every situation, take up what? Faith. Faith. Every situation. Every situation. Believing, trusting God has delivered you, secured you, and sent you. We can say it this way. We are saved, we are sealed, we are sent. We live by faith. When we stand up, it's relational to faith. We, we have faith that Jesus Christ, who said his body and blood would save us, we believe that by faith. As we walk on and we begin to doubt our salvation, staying in Jesus, we know that he has sealed us. Not only did he save us through his body and blood, but he saved us by breathing the Holy Spirit on, onto us, upon us. The Holy Spirit lives with us. The Holy Spirit, the presence of God. And in this, He has sent us. I want you to think about this for a moment. Here's an application part of this message. It's good to learn all the armor, right? Amen? But if we don't apply it, what difference does it make? So in this application, here at this church, part of our vision, we are praying for our community, specifically 20602 of St. Charles. And we are praying for our, who's our one, that one person who is far and away from God. Daily, I'm praying for our community and my one. Question. See if you pass, and I'll end my sermon if you pass. Do you think that might stimulate a spiritual battle? Say yes or no. Yes. yes. Why? Remember what the war, the struggle, the battle is all about. If the church goes into this community and penetrates the lostness with the name of Jesus Christ, who's winning the war? Jesus Christ. Now, hang with me just a little bit. I've been praying for five years now the same prayer for the community God has placed me in. 
And some of my ones took a long time. Some I'm still praying for. Does that mean God has favorably said yes to this and no to that? I don't think so. I believe when I pray for a soul to find Jesus that I've engaged, I've been engaged in a serious battle of demonic forces. I know there's many in the church that would dismiss it. And I want to tell you, I'm not trying to be upper handed here, but there's a spiritual battle to even believe what I just said. There's a spiritual battle to look at the cross, the representation of the cross, and there see Jesus where he hung for all of humanity. And that's, that's not even mention the empty tomb. There's a spiritual battle for you to say, come on, an empty tomb? Who can rise from the dead? Answer, God. <laughs> that's who can rise from the dead. But Satan says, no, 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 no. Don't believe that. See, through Hollywood, we have these visions of demons being red with pointy tails and little pitchforks and all these wild things that Hollywood, most of them on drugs, have conjured up. Demons can look like a beautiful book of philosophy. Demons can look like a beautiful woman that you're attracted to or a man. Demons can do all kinds of things to mess with all kinds of people. And there's only one name that I can remain and stand in to survive the battle. His name is Jesus Christ. My moral and ethics will not survive, but the name of Jesus Christ will survive. So let me quickly move on. Let me give you a finally. In our armor is a weapon of offense, but also can be used as defense. We see here the sword of the spirit, which is the word of a God, which is the word of God. The word of God is to defend as well as to move forward in. In Hebrews 4:12 it says the word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword going forward or going back. And it's effective, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrows. What's that saying? Let me kind of begin to close on this thought. If we follow the word of instruction called the Bible, and we read and meditate on the word of God, and we live on every word from the mouth of God until so we read it, we meditate, we apply it, and we engage by standing in the struggle to, for Christ to bring us through. Then we understand that the word of God at times in our life is going to expose us to something we should not be doing. It's going to expose us to something that we have to put off so that we can put on Christ Jesus. And so in this spiritual battle, one of the techniques is to convince you that you don't need to read the Word of God every day to be saved. But yet, Peter in his letter to the church says that we've been saved through the enduring Word of God. We've been deceived also to think, well, I'm saved. I don't need to be in church to be saved. That's the same half-truth that Satan told Jesus in the wilderness for those 40 days. Because the saved will be in church. But church can't save you. Only the name of Jesus Christ can save you. But those in the name of Jesus Christ will gather in his church because he builds up the church in his name. So this word of God is penetrating. And part of the spiritual battle is many has been deceived not to be in the Word of God or to catch it on Sunday or to catch it in a discipleship group or a Sunday school class or whatever. But during the week, they'll just go about their own business. That's someone who's walking naked without spiritual armor. Because the Word of God in the book of Revelations is called Jesus. He is the Word of God. And it's the sword of the Spirit because the Holy Spirit has breathed every word out for our edification, for our building up all, all that we are in Christ. The Word of God is there for each one of us. It's written by God. It's breathed out by God. 
and it was fulfilled in God's flesh, Jesus Christ. And so, the armor of God, truth is Jesus, righteousness is Jesus, the gospel of peace is Jesus, faith in and of Jesus alone, the word of God is all about Jesus, and Romans 12, 1 says, don't be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. Jesus is good. And although this sounds offensive, we are not. If we were good, Jesus would have never had to come down from his glory and die on the cross for us. But now, if I'm good enough that I didn't need that, then I'm righteous in myself, and I can go on with life. I don't need Jesus. But if I accept the word of God, that not one is good, no, not one, then I know I need Jesus. And as soon as I say, I know I need Jesus, the spiritual war takes effect. It rages. You'll have thoughts to distract you. You'll be distracted by people getting up and leaving the sanctuary. You'll be distracted by... Uh, your stomach growling, you'll be distracted by a hundred things when you make a decision to stand for Jesus Christ. And once you're distracted, then the rationalizations begin. Well, I've always got till tomorrow. Well, when I get married and have kids, I'll, I'll take care of this later. Or maybe this one. Well, I got to find out what my friends would think first because I don't want to lose those in my and all along, you're thinking, this is just reasonable thinking. But all along, in truth, it's the spiritual battle for your soul. For what one of us know if we have tomorrow? What one of us knows whether we'll even make it home after church today? What one of us knows whether Jesus Christ would come in all of his glory before next Sunday? We don't. We have no control over those things but we can stand with the one who holds all things in his hands. His name is Jesus Christ. And so Christian, if you're hearing the Holy Spirit say, put something off, know that you're engaged in the spiritual battle. If you're hearing things like, well, demons kind of extreme, we, we really don't. Jesus took care of all those things in his earthly ministry. We don't have those anymore. You're probably with one right now because that's satanic thinking. He tries to keep from being exposed. That's part of his deception. So the spiritual battle rages, but praise God, Jesus Christ has overcome. This Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. What we've done wrong that Jesus freely forgives and for those who don't believe, he convicts their hearts. Righteousness, who is Jesus, and judgment. Satan's already been condemned. And only us in the sanctuary can be condemned outside of Jesus Christ. Because we too have committed sin. But in Christ it's been paid in full. So when we look at the spiritual battle, the most obvious evidence is when we need to make a decision for the Lord. What begins to happen around us? Paul used the word cosmic. Some of you might say crazy things start happening. Take heart. Stand with Jesus. Stand on Jesus. Stand with Jesus. And never let go. For our Jesus will never let us go. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you would help us as we take these words, meditate on these words, think through these words. Lord, there are many who reject the word of God. There are many who reject the name of Jesus. There are many... There are many who reject virtually most of what's been said this morning from your word. Lord, we know they're not the enemy. For you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten son. 
But we know in the Word of God that this cosmic battle, this battle for the souls of men and women rages. And Lord, I thank you for this church where you have called us together and we have been saved in your name. We have been sealed in your name. We have been given victory in your name. And I thank you that you remind us to wear the armor. How often we go racing out the door without taking you with us, Jesus. How often we race out the door without having had our daily food. How often, as we'll see next week, we race out the door with prayer that strengthens. Lord, help us in these things not to have just attended a service with a message, but that we can leave with a word to meditate on and to apply in your name. Lord, if there is one here who is struggling in a wrestling match to receive you as Lord and Savior, enable them, Lord, as you have said in your word, Enable them by the grace of the Holy Spirit, I pray. And for those of us that you are working with to, to move and to make decisions and to call us into certain places and opportunities of, of what you are designing for each one of us, then I pray that you would enable us so that your name may be glorified. I ask this in your precious and holy name. Amen. We're going to stand and sing this hymn of invitation.